Hello and welcome to another Houdini tutorial. I'm Stuart, this is Making Biocinematics, and today we're going to be looking at creating some molecular representations, a protein structure, specifically an actin filament, and how we can turn that actin filament into a tool that we can use in a variety of scenes. So I'm just going to jump right into Houdini and we can get started. So, woo! So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be building a tool that when you have some curves or you draw curves or you generate curves in any number of ways, it will automatically build these structurally accurate actin filaments along the curves. And we can apply some settings to our tool here to change it from a surface to an atom representation or change the surface resolution to high resolution. It's just gonna bake that for a few seconds, but once we've done that, we can very quickly change between those and we can always draw more high resolution structures and you can see this happens very quickly actually once that initial network has been cooked but if we do change it to an atomic representation the viewport is going to chug a little bit just because there are so many atoms there's going to be hundreds of thousands of these atoms it's worth noting that in the viewport display here, the color of these atoms isn't quite correct, but you don't have to worry about that too much for now because when you render it, everything will look correct. If you look at the video description, there's a link to files that you can download to work alongside me if you want to do that. And the way that I've set that up is I have a file here with a network. If you look under actin filament or actin, um, there's a final network, which is what we're gonna be building. And there's a second copy of these colored boxes. And these boxes are just for organizational purposes. And so you can work alongside me and put the nodes in the various places and just uh, help keep things organized a little bit. So if you'd like to work alongside me, you can do that, or you can just watch and, and follow along later. And I also have that final network there so you can uh, see what the final results should be anyways. So the intent of this tutorial is uh, threefold. First, we're gonna be looking at how to import and work with molecular data from the protein data bank, which is a database of structures, mostly protein structures. So we're gonna be looking at importing those. Then we're gonna be looking at how we can create a couple of different representations of molecules, an atomic space filling representation that we just saw and a surface representation and how to use Houdini's nodes to build those. And then third, after we're building our actin filament, I want to explain and explore a little bit about how to make Houdini digital assets so you can package up networks into tools that you can use across different files and share with other people if you want. So data import, molecular representations, and Houdini digital assets. So this is the structure we're going to be working with, F-actin. This is the filamentous version of the actin monomer when it's in that long strand that we saw. I actually downloaded this file and processed it a little bit, and there's a link to download that file as well so that you can use that too, although you can go straight to the source if you want to do that as well. And the version that I've given you, I've added hydrogen atoms to because a lot of these structures in the protein data bank don't have hydrogen atoms in that actual structural format. And very quickly, the way that I've done that is I've brought this structure into a program like Chimera X and I'm adding this, or I'm using this command add H, all one word, space, and then number one, and that's for the structure. This is just ID number one. And when I execute that, it's gonna go through and it's gonna calculate where all of those hydrogen atoms should be. And it will give you a few different uh, notes here. They've added over 2,900 hydrogen atoms, which is awesome. And then I save that out as a PDB, and that's the file that I provided you. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do in Houdini is we're going to actually bring in that data. So I'm going to get rid of this null and just put down a file node here. And I'm going to go find that path. So I saved it on my desktop uh, for now. And if I hit space F in the viewport, I can zoom in and I can see immediately that Houdini has recognized this protein data bank file format and it's brought in each atom as a single point. If you've seen my previous tutorial series, the carbon nanotube uh, mini series, then I've explained a lot more about how geometry works in Houdini. Or if, you've, if you're familiar with Houdini, you'll probably know that points are just essentially uh, a dot in 3D space with associated data. And with the geometry spreadsheet down here, 
we can see that each row, each point, uh, corresponds to a single atom. So if we select a point here, I'll just grab this point and I'll go view only show selected. We can see that we've selected 0.565. We have the XYZ coordinates in 3D space. We have the chain ID and in this protein structure, we only have a single chain, but if you have more complicated structures, you might have multiple chains stuck together. This is a hydrogen atom. Um, it has a name and there's a certain way that these atoms are named. Um, it's fairly consistent for the most part. So you can use those names to do various things with your uh, structures. This is part of a residue called histidine. And that's one of the 20 amino acids. This is number 40, amino acid 40 in the sequence. And it has a serial, which is just an identifier um, and some other things. Okay, I'll just look at all of these here. This final column here, this group head atom. So in Houdini, a group is a special kind of attribute that can either be zero if a point is not in that group or one if the point is in that group. And what a head atom is, it's a hetero atom that just means it's different from the main structure, the primary structure. So in this case, if we click on the column and sort by head atom, the ones that are in the group that have the value one are either a calcium ion or part of a small molecule called ADP. And that's a small molecule that's bound to the actin protein. So in this case, because I'm trying to keep things relatively simple for this tutorial, I'm actually just gonna get rid of those. But if you are working with your own molecular structures, you may wanna treat those differently or work those into your structure somehow. You could split them out and, and create a different kind of structure for them. But right now I'm just gonna get rid of them by using a blast node. And a blast node deletes geometry. And what we're gonna be deleting is this het atom group. And we could be explicit and say this is a point group, but it automatically guessed that that's that was the case. Okay, so now those things are gone. There's nothing in this head atom group anymore. What we wanna do is we're creating a couple of different representations. One representation is gonna be the space filling model. And space filling model essentially shows the van der Waals radius of each atom as a sphere. So we're gonna be copying a sphere to each of the points. So let's create a sphere. And there's a couple of different types of sphere that we could create. We can create a regular, just a primitive, which is essentially treating that sphere as one single entity of geometry with no extra resolution or properties um, other than basically the, the position and the radius. Uh, we could also create a polygon, which if we zoom in and look at it, we can see that it actually is made up of triangles and we could increase the frequency to get more triangles. Depending on how what you're doing with the geometry and what kind of way that you're rendering it, um, you could either choose polygon or primitive. Uh, to keep things simple, I'm just gonna use primitive. That's just gonna be represented as a single sort of sphere object. Um, and we're gonna copy those two points. So copy to points has two inputs. We're gonna have the geometry to copy. That's the sphere we're gonna copy and we're gonna copy the point data. I'm actually gonna put down a null here underneath this blast, and we're gonna call this point, point data. I could capitalize that, point data. So this point data, we're gonna plug into that second input, the target points that we wanna copy to. And if we put the display flag on here, it's not the template flag, but the display flag, then we see we've got um, spheres for each of the atoms. So that's pretty good. So the data that that we have on these points um, actually gets carried through to the sphere geometry that we're copying to. So we can see that we've got all of the original data. And the one that I actually care about the most is this element. Because what we wanna do is we wanna treat each of the elements a little bit differently because for representing them, we typically have different colors for each of the atoms or for each of the elements. Carbon is usually a black or dark gray. Oxygen is usually some kind of red, nitrogen, some kind of blue, et cetera, et cetera. So we wanna treat that differently. And also the van der Waals radius of each element is also gonna be different. So we wanna, we wanna treat that differently too. And when we're using copy to points, we can copy 
attributes and data from the points to the spheres. And I'll show you how that works. So if we put down a color node, because color is one of the things that we care about, and put it upstream of this copy to points, if we just choose random here, we can see that each point is colored differently and that gets propagated to the spheres that we're copying to them. Okay, so that's good, but we don't want just a random color. We actually want specific colors. So we're gonna color um, the color carbon here. And so what we wanna do for the group is specify that we only want this to apply to the ones that for which the element attribute is C. So for attributes, we prefix that with the at symbol, at element, that means this element attribute here, equals C. So for when the element equals C, then it's gonna give it a random color. We don't want a random color, we want a constant color, and that's gonna be something like a dark gray or a black. Now that's not showing up here and that's because the group type, it's not quite sure about that. So we're gonna say that this is point data that we're dealing with because this is a, a point element or a point attribute. All right, now that's working. Okay, so the next thing we wanna do is deal with the radius. And the way that radius works or scale works when we're copying, um, we're using copy to points is Houdini looks for a certain number of inbuilt attributes, which aren't actually on this, these points yet. So we can create a new attribute and that attribute is called P scale short for point scale, I believe. So we're going to say this is P scale for C and the attribute is going to be P scale. And we've got to make sure that we spell it correctly. P scale, all one word, lowercase. And we also want that to apply to the same group, these element equals C. So I'll copy and paste that over here. And we wanna make sure that this is saying this is point data that we're dealing with. Um, and the value we wanna apply for carbon is 1.7 angstroms is the van der Waals radius. And when we put that in, we can see that the carbon atoms blow up to what looks to be probably the right size. Um, but the other ones are left with a scale of zero and that's because they get lumped into this default value. And that's okay, we'll deal with these different elements uh, individually, but what we might want to do is just put a, a default value of like 0.5 or 0.3 in here so that we know that we have points left to deal with. So now that we've deal, dealt with color and scale, and we could do this sort of all in one node if we wanted to, we could use a wrangle and type in a little bit of code and that would be nice and quick and easy. But just for the sake of simplicity, we're not actually gonna be dealing with any code in this tutorial. I'm just gonna use these, these type of nodes here and copy and paste them five times for the different um, elements. So we've got carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and sulfur. So we'll just paste those in here, maybe offset them a little bit so they kind of have some visual grouping. Uh, so I guess we want five total, one, two, three, four, five, good. So this is gonna be color for oxygen and P scale for oxygen. This one's gonna be color for nitrogen and P scale for nitrogen and color for sulfur, P scale for sulfur, color for hydrogen and P scale for hydrogen. And then we gotta go into the nodes and actually change the attributes. So we gotta make sure this is gonna be O and this is gonna be kind of a red and you could, there's some sort of standard colors. Um, you can choose your own or find something that looks attractive. So again here, element equals O, not 1.7, but let me just look this up here and make sure I get it right. So this is me 1.52 for oxygen. Nitrogen here, it's gonna be kind of a sky blue color. You can kind of desaturate that or play with it a little bit. Um, and the P scale for nitrogen is gonna be 1.5, whoops, 1.55. Just a little bit bigger than oxygen. Sulfur, it's gonna be a nice yellow color. There's not very many sulfur atoms in a typical protein, but they're there. And the P scale for sulfur. 
1.8. There you go. You can see them there. Um, and hydrogen. Finally, if you had some nucleic acid or something like that, then you would probably want to have uh, phosphorus as well. Um, so 1.2 for hydrogen. Do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and there might be some other elements like uh, for we had cal uh, yeah calcium ions and if you had all if you want to do all the possible elements that might show up in your structures then you probably would want to set this up a little bit differently than this you might want to use the wrangle like I suggested and just type in the attributes or maybe pull in a spreadsheet or there's lots of clever things that you could do to kind of get this attribute data on a per element basis but for us this is going to work just fine for now. So there we have it. So there we've got um, a, a molecular structure, an actin monomer that has all five elements with the proper scale and proper color. And if you wanted to do something like a scale modifier, you could always go back to the sphere and just change the uniform scale. Um, but I'm just going to leave that at one. All right, so I'll just put a null uh, node down here. Say this is our atoms. Nice capital letters. Um, so this is just kind of a, a bookmark for our network so that when we're building up more complicated networks, we can easily see where the kind of end point of various parts of that network are. Okay, so let's turn our attention to a surface structure. And instead of building onto the end of this atoms here, I'm gonna go back up to our point data and create a branch off here for our surface representation. So to create a surface representation, I'm going to use something called a particle fluid surface. And what that does is it creates a surface that looks at the underlying points and how far apart they are and creates kind of this blobby mesh around the outside of that. So we could do this in a variety of different um, resolutions that have different sort of adhere more closely to the the atoms and have more detail or we can have something that's very coarse and smooth um, with a lot less polygons for lighter rendering and calculation and higher res for more intensive and for different looks and there's a variety of reasons why why you might want one or the other but we're going to start with a low resolution here and maybe we'll make a high resolution copy as well so we'll call this low res low res surface and the settings that i found work for this you can play with them on your own as well but i'll just put the display flag on here and you can see we don't have any surface structure yet um, but i'm going to change the particle separation to 1.4 a voxel scale of one and an iso value of 1.8 and that still looks pretty high resolution. I'm actually gonna put down another node called Remesh. And what Remesh does is it kind of creates a new mesh that has more or less polygons on the surface based on a target length. Now, I don't want a target size of 0.2. I want something a lot bigger. I'm gonna do seven. Um, and for this actually to work, actually I have to go back to this particle fluid surface and make sure that I'm converting to a surface polygons rather than surface polygon soup, which is just a little bit of a different data type. So surface polygons, and I go back to the remesh and that's working a lot better. I'm actually gonna increase the iterations to three and I'm gonna add a little bit of smoothing and I'm gonna turn off recompute normals because I don't want one of these hard faceting edges here. I want this just to stay kind of smooth. There we go. So there's kind of a low res surface representation of that uh, actin monomer. So now I'm gonna copy both of these. I'll call this low res remesh. Copy both of these over here, just beside, and I'm gonna call this one high res. And when we're making our tool at the end, what we can do is we can switch between the different resolutions um, for different purposes. Okay, so I'm going to change the particle separation down to 0.7, um, the voxel scale down to 0.6, the droplet scale up to 1.3, and the ISO value down to 0.7. And that's going to take a couple seconds to calculate, 
and then we've got pretty high resolution mesh here. We're going to remesh it as well. So we're going to change the target size to one. That's the, the distance between um, points, basically, the target edge length for this kind of mesh. I'm going to turn down the uh, iterations, I think, so it doesn't have to calculate quite so long. Um, and that smoothing is OK. Actually, going to turn on recompute normals. I've noticed some blotching in certain areas depending on the resolution of the mesh. Mesh. So with this resolution, recompute normals tends to work better. There we go. So we have quite a detailed, dense uh, mesh for that actin monomer. And to switch between these, we can use something called a switch node. And a switch node, as the name implies, allow you to switch between inputs. So if we put the display flag on here and change from input zero, so the first one, we're in computer land, we're always counting by zero or starting with zero. So the first input is zero, the second put input is one. So we go from between zero and one. And so there we can switch between those two uh, representations. And similarly, I'm just gonna drop down a null after this and say that this is our surface. Similarly, we can switch between the atoms and the surface. So I'm going to put down another switch node here. Put in the atoms on one end and surface on the other option. And we could call this our representation switch. And this one might be our resolution switch or surface resolution switch or something like that. Okay, so here we can switch between atoms and and because I've changed the network, it might have to take a little bit to calculate. Oh, that looks pretty good. Atoms and surface. Now, if you're building your own molecular visualization tool, you might want to have the possibility of having both atoms and surface and ball and stick and backbones and other various different kinds of representations. And so you could build that into your tool. So instead of having a switch, you might have um, merge and then do various things with the different things, group them together. Um, but again, just to keep things relatively simple for this tutorial, we're just going to switch and have an either or scenario. Okay, fantastic. Without a tremendous amount of work, we've created a pretty nice PDB molecular data importer and visualizer. And because this is all procedural, we could put any PDB file that we wanted in here and assuming that it's properly formatted and it has, I guess, just carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and hydrogen, we would get a correct result. So that's pretty nice. So what do we want to do next? Well, we want to actually turn this into a filament. So what we're going to start off with is just copying this monomer uh, vertically in the y-axis and use that as just kind of a, a test case for polymerizing our, our actin. Um, and then we're gonna make it more complicated by copying it along a curve. So the simple case first, we're gonna do a copy and transform. And in order to make this a little bit more efficient, what we can do is kind of pack the geometry that's here, this single monomer into a single entity so that in essence, we're kind of instancing that along. And the copy and transform has that functionality built in with this pack and instance, but sometimes I like to do that as a separate step. So just so I can see what's happening and have a little bit more control over it. So I'm going to put down a pack node, which does the same thing. It just, it's compressing all of that information to, into a single entity so that, um, I mean, it saves on memory and computation time and, and a lot of different things. I'm going to change the pivot location to origin. And if we change the display flag, this looks basically the same, um, except in the geometry spreadsheet, we just have a single point and a single primitive with this path here, actin filament pack one. I'm gonna change this to actin monomer, so it has a better name, so we can see what that is. And then we're gonna plug that into copy here. And I think what I might do is change the input from uh, atoms to uh, a surface representation. Might look a little bit easier to visually parse that and compute. And we'll make maybe 10 copies. And we're gonna translate this up. I'll put the display flag on here. 
And if I look at some scientific papers, I found out that the vertical or the, the distance between monomers, if we're looking at it in this in it along the long axis, is 27.615 uh, angstroms. And in Houdini here with this molecular data, one unit equals one angstrom. So we can, so it's pretty easy to work with there. Okay, so there we go. So we have the, the monomers copied up, but they're not rotated properly. From one unit to the next, there's actually a rotation in Y of negative 166.6 degrees. And if we do that, then we can see these kind of have this uh, if we increase the the number here, we kind of have this sort of higher order spiral helix structure. Um, and from one to the next, it's almost like they're almost 180 degrees flipped, but not quite. And so this might look plausible, but the actual orientation of each monomer is not correct. And so the way that I did this when I was figuring out the transforms for this was I imported um, another PDB file that had a biological assembly of a handful of different monomers together. And so I could see how the, the relationship between monomers should be. And I just kind of matched those up by eye so that the monomers are sitting in the proper position. So what I wanted to do is put another transform in, and we could do that in a variety of places, but I think what I want to do is right at the very beginning, put down a transform node um, so that I can get those transforms um, properly right out of the gate. So I'm going to do um, monomer orientation here. And the values that I found, we want to transform the pivot actually so that the rotation happens more or less around the center of that monomer. So the pivot um, translate is going to be 20.5, 0 0.3, and 2.9 in X, Y, and Z. And that hasn't changed anything, but it's moved that pivot point away from the origin to here, so that when I put in rotate values, it, it rotates around the right point. All right, under translate, we're gonna do negative 38.9, 0 0.4, and 5.1. And now you can see that whole complex is shifting around so that it uh, looks quite different. And in rotation, we wanna do 90.5, negative 28.2 and negative 184. Okay, and so that in theory should be a much more accurate actin filament. So now we have a straight actin filament and we could make that as long as we want by just increasing the number here, make it super long. Um, but what we actually want to do is put this along a curve. So in the tool that we want to develop, we want to put that along any curve that the user might give us. But for the sake of the testing and making sure that everything works properly, we're going to put in our own curve here. So I'm going to put it in the input curve box and I'm just going to create this big zigzag shape here. Now, if the user gave us this curve um, and we tried to put actin along it, it would look kind of bad because actin filaments shouldn't have sharp angles as far as I'm aware. They should have kind of more gentle curves because of their inherent structure. So what we want to do is process this curve a little bit. So in this process curve box, I'm going to put down a resample. And what a resample does is it changes how many points are along that curve. And right now it's doing one every 0.1 units, which is way too tiny. I'm going to do something like 200. And if we turn on the point display, we can see that it's spaced out points along that. And if we change the treat polygons as straight edges to subdivision curves, then we can see we kind of get this smooth shape now. So that's starting to look okay, um, but we might want to smooth that even further. And I think what I would like to have is for the tool, have the user be able to control the strength of that smoothing and the filter quality here. But for now, I'm just going to turn down the filter quality and maybe increase the smoothing a little bit and get even more of a, a gentle curve. And then for the actual part of putting that actin monomer along the curve, remember that each actin monomer um, along the straight version was 27.6 something units apart from each other. So in order to make this copy along the curve work properly, I wanna resample our curve so that it also has that spacing. 
So I'm going to change this uh, to 27 point, was it 615? And one minor detail about this, we actually want to have this subdivision curves as well, so it's even a little bit smoother. Um, but if you look at the end here, and if you look at our original point there, you can see that the end at the same point. And what this resample is doing is it's not putting these points exactly this length apart because the total length of that input curve isn't going to be an exact multiple of that. And so it's going to figure out what the closest value is and kind of even everything out. So I don't want that because that's going to make if our curve changes length or if it's not exactly a close enough value, it's going to have our monomer space differently or jittering up and down if the curve is changing length. Anyways, the point is we want to uncheck this box, even last segment, same length. So what that's going to do is it's going to crop the curve potentially a little bit, but it's going to make sure that all of the points are exactly spaced um, this distance apart. So it's going to actually end up being a lot more stable and accurate. Okay, so now we've got our input curve. Now basically we just want to copy these this monomer to the curve. So we're going to do a copy to curves. There we go. And again, on here, we're going to have the geometry to copy and the curve that we want to copy it to. All right, we'll put the display flag on there. And now we've got that monomer copied along, but it's not twisting. We need to add in some kind of twist. So we're going to go into this settings here. We're going to do additional rotations and we're going to apply a rule or twist. Sounds good. And in the partial twist, we want to do negative 166.6, the same value that we used for the copy and transform. But actually what that does is it applies this value over the entire length of the curve. And what we want to do is apply it per unit. So we're going to change twist per to per edge, twist per, per edge, and that's per unit, we're gonna be twisting this amount. All right, now we're looking like we've got an actin filament, but we still have one more problem. If we compare the two kinds of actin filaments, this one is correct and this one is not correct because when we're using this copy and transform, we're assuming that the long axis is the Y axis and this copy to curve assumes that I think it's the positive Z axis. I'm not 100% sure about that, but the point is we need to add a kind of transform offset in between our monomer and the copy and just rotate it around the x-axis 90 degrees and now we've got the actin filament aligned properly so i'll just call this axis change there we go and now we've got our final actin filament fantastic so we've made one actin filament can we make more actin filaments yes all we have to do is change the input curves and maybe i'll put down a stroke and a stroke allows you to draw in the viewport instead of putting down individual control vertices. So I'm gonna put that one on and just draw them out and look at that, we're making actin. Awesome. Um, so now what we want to do is kind of wrap this into a tool that the user can play with a few properties and kind of package it up so that you can have it in different scenes and have multiple different actin um, sort of groups and settings and, and, and kind of apply it in a variety of situations. And the way that we do that is using something called a Houdini digital asset or HDA for short. You might've heard about HDAs. An HDA is a package that lives on your hard drive or in a folder separate from the file that you're actually working with. It's an external asset, um, but that means that you can put it in any kind of scene and you can manage them and, and transfer them and have different versions of them and do lots of cool stuff with. So the way that we're going to do that is we're going to take this input curve and kind of move it out because that's the only thing that we don't want in our tool. The rest of it, we're gonna put a big marquee box all the way around that, make sure that we select everything and click this cardboard icon, cardboard box icon that says create subnet from selected. So we're gonna click on that and everything gets collapsed into one single node. That's just called subnet one for now. 
It's got a variety of inputs. Um, but we'll make sure that that stroke is still connected to that first input. And we're going to right click on this and we're going to create a digital asset. Now, if you have the um, what used to be called the Game Labs tools, but now I, I they have a new name for it. Anyways, if you have those installed, there's this extra thing here called a version digital asset, which is just kind of a nice interface for um, creating and, and, and managing digital assets. I'm going to do this the, the old way that I'm familiar with, um, but you can definitely explore that as, as part of your workflow. So create digital asset. Now we get a, a name and an operator label and the name can have, this is sort of the technical name for it that can have different namespaces if you want to put things in subdirectories and, and kind of manage this a little more complex way. Um, you can look into doing that and I might have more tutorials about managing things um, in, in those ways uh, later on. But again, to try and keep things simple, I'm just going to call this actin filament. Um, not, not filament with an E, filament. And the label is kind of the nice name for it that you're going to be searching for and seeing in your menus. Um, and then we're going to save this to a library. And sort of the default place to put it in is documents and your Houdini version and a subfolder called OTLs. That's the old name for HDAs, essentially. Um, and then you've got your name act and filament which should match some closely to your operator name um, and dot hda and i've got dot hda lc because i've got the indie version which adds this lc for limited commercial um, anyways so that's a dot hda lc and i'll just hit accept and so that's going to save that into that file separate from my file so this subnetwork is now kind of an external asset and now it pulls up an interface with, with lots of tabs and lots of complicated things to deal with. But the only thing that we really care about right now is creating a little bit of an interface. Right now it's blank here in the parameters pane. We want to create some settings that the user can use to you know, adjust the act and filament that, um, geometry that they're creating. So if I click over here to parameters, there's a whole bunch of parameters. Whoops, not filter six. Um, there's a whole bunch of parameters that you can create, different types of parameters that you can create, float, uh, integers, labels, menus, files, datas, colors, buttons, all this sort of stuff. There's a really easy way to create settings though. And that's if we dive into the subnet by double clicking on it, we can see we've got that network that we created here. If we select something that we want to add, for example, we want to be able to switch between representations, we can just grab that parameter and drag it here. And we could give it a label so that the user knows what it does. Select input doesn't mean too much. So we're going to call this representation um, so that they can switch between the two representations. And I'll just leave that there for now. Um, I'm going to grab another one resolution switch we're going to do grab this one and again instead of select input we might want to do resolution and what else do we want to do we wanted smoothing settings so we could go into smooth and put it in here strength i'll just call it smooth strength so people know what that means and smooth filter quality so again people know what that means and I think that's probably good for now. So that gives people some things to work with when they're creating the structure. If you wanted to get really detailed, you could maybe expose like the colors that people can choose for different things, or there's, there's limitless ways that you could manage this. You could have an option to show or hide head atoms or do things like that. Okay. I'll turn off that template there because we don't need that anymore. We don't need this at all. We could delete it if we wanted to. Um, okay, so we'll go press U to jump back up. I'm just going to hit apply here. And you can see that all of those settings now appear in this subnet, this actin filament tool. Um, and we can hit accept to accept that. And if we've made any changes inside this HDA, what we want to make sure you do is save node type. Because again, this doesn't really live in this file anymore. We want to make sure that that um, HDA on disk is getting updated. So we'll do save node type. And now it's updating what that, um, 
they're called operators, but basically what this network looks like for this tool. Um, and we have this lock icon. We could go in here and mess around, but if we don't want people doing that, we can match current definition, um, which updates the network to the most recent version that you've saved. So good thing we just saved, otherwise we would lose the changes. Um, but it also locks that, so when we go in here, we're not really able to mess around. So if we wanted to edit this further, we would just right click and do allow editing of contents. And if we wanna change the interface, which actually we might wanna do, we can go to type properties and that pulls back up um, these settings. So just as a sort of quality of life thing, what I might wanna do is under representation, instead of an integer, actually, you know what, I'll just show you how this works a little bit. So for the stroke, I'll just hit X and remove a few of these just so we're dealing with one stroke here. So for this, we could change this from subnet to actin or call it whatever we want, my actin. Um, and this is of type actin filament, that's pretty cool. Um, and in fact, just to prove that this is an external thing now, we could delete it. And if you hit type and search for actin filament, uh, I have made a variety of copies of this for the purpose of this tutorial. But I think the one that we just made is called actin filaments and we'll drop it down there. Nope, this is the workshop version. So I'll try again, actin filaments. There we go, that's the one that we were working on. Let's put the display flag on there. Um, so the representation, we could change this from surface to atoms. And again, you'll notice that I said like these colors don't quite match up to the actual element types. And there's some weirdness going on with how the that color attribute is being promoted to for the viewport. But when you render it, it actually works out okay. The underlying data is correct. Um, and the resolution we can change to one. And the first time we sort of build this, it's gonna have to calculate that remeshing. But once that's done, this should be very quick to switch between low and high res. And then for that curve, we could change that smoothing. We can make this very straight or not so straight and then turn off smoothing altogether and just play with it. Yeah. So again, so this one zero, like these things don't mean very much to the user. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to type properties and I'm going to change this from an integer to a menu because that's a lot nicer to work with. So an ordered menu and then under the menu tab, we can change what the different values represent or what the different labels correspond to different values. Anyways, zero was the first input. So that was the atoms. So I'm going to do atoms. One is surface, so I'm going to do surface. And that just gives you a label for the different um, values. So I'll do accept. So we need to unlock and save that, um, save this node. Um, and that's fine. We want to save that. So I'm going to just go back into here and change the resolution as well from an integer to a menu. And under menu, we had zero was low res and one was high res and we'll do apply and accept, and it's already unlocked, so that's fine. And there we go, so we've got surface, atoms. Again, the, the, there's so many of them that the viewport doesn't even wanna display all of them. You can change in the um, optimized settings, the polygon limits. This is 100 million polygons before it starts to like stop. All right, and then we've got high, high res, there we go. And we'll just do save node type and match current definition. And there we've got a nice little actin filament tool. And again, so these input curves, you could do whatever you want. You could change the input. You could copy and paste and make a bunch of these with different settings. Um, yeah, so I hope this has inspired you to build your own tools, explore how Houdini can allow you to 
create different kinds of molecular visualization and work with molecular data and other kinds of scientific data and build tools that you can, or build networks that you can wrap into tools, expose different settings and really make your own workflows easier or share or even sell. Um, but really I find this a great way to kind of package assets for my own workflows and make working in science animation so much nicer and easier and a lot of fun. So I hope that was helpful and interesting and hopefully useful for your future workflows. If you thought this was good, feel free to, to give a thumbs up and subscribe to Making Biocinematics for more behind the scenes and tutorials and extra things like that. And thanks so much for watching. Bye.